Okay. There we go. Is that better? That is better. I can hear you now. Fantastic. And Lauren, are we good? We are good. Okay. Fantastic. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Shelly Gupta Barnes. I'm the National Policy Director for the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And we are here for this uh, congressional briefing on a third reconstruction agenda and the mass poor peoples and low wage workers assembly in March on Washington. We are here just three days before this assembly and historic gathering of poor and low income people in Washington DC with members of Congress who will hear directly from poor and low income people who are part of this campaign and who are among the 140 million poor and low income people in this country. They, along with our national co-chairs, Reverend Dr. Barber and Reverend Liz Theo Harris, will offer testimony to our members of Congress on the conditions facing nearly 40% of this nation, why we need a third reconstruction agenda to confront systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, the denial of health care, and the militarism and the false narratives of religious nationalism and white supremacy. And we will also talk about what that agenda looks like. I want to thank uh, the host for this briefing, along with the Poor People's Campaign, uh, the re uh, Repairs of the Breach, and the Cairo Center, the Institute for Policy Studies, and the Economic Policy uh, Institute are co-hosting this briefing, and our honorary hosts, of course, the Congressional Progressive Caucus, and the Majority Leader Task Force on Poverty and Opportunity. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, John Cavana and I from IPS will be moderating our time. Um, this is a hybrid beef briefing. So after opening statements from Congresswoman Lee and Congresswoman Jayapal um, and, our, and, and Reverend Liz Theo Harris, we will hear from six of our testifiers who are here in person. We'll have a few minutes for questions and then we'll hear from five uh, additional testifiers who are joining virtually, again, followed by questions. And then we'll close with, the, with, um, with some words from Congressman Kana. Great, thank you, Shally. Um, and thank you all for being here. This uh, briefing is about to be kicked off by two true leaders who've been leaders both before they were in Congress as activists on the side of poor people and low wage workers and now as members of Congress. Uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee of California, co-chair of the Majority Leader Task Force on Poverty and Opportunity, and Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal from Washington State, chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. From the start of the Poor People's Campaign five years ago, both of these amazing women have been champions of the bold agenda from health care for all to slashing the military budget the war budget laid out so forcefully in the third reconstruction resolution of 2021. Both have spent much of their careers working with poor people and low wage workers. Welcome first, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Hey, good afternoon and welcome. Thank you uh, so much for being here, bearing witness once again. And presenting testimony as to what members of Congress and policymakers should automatically know <laughs> and automatically do if in fact we're really about seeking justice and equality and the quality of life that everyone so deserves in this wealthy country. So thank you so much for being here and to uh, Bishop Barber, to Reverend Theo Harris, to Shelley, to all of you, to John, uh, thank you so much for keeping us very focused on, on our purpose. And also I must just uh, thank our chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus because the Progressive Caucus under Congresswoman Jayapal's leadership continues each and every day to fight for justice, to fight for equality, to fight to close the gap between the rich and the poor. And Congresswoman Jayapal, I think you've seen and you know her and um, she takes no prisoners. <laughs> when it comes to people power, and when it comes to the empowerment of people whose voices uh, should be heard in each and every policy that we're working on here on Capitol Hill. And of course, our colleague, Congressman Ro Khanna, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, and Ro is a person who, um, I call him a progressive economist. <laughs> 
who really has been able to lay out how um, this country should work in terms of its resources and in terms of resource allocation. And of course, our chairman, Bobby Scott, who will join us in a minute, who chairs the Education and Labor Committee, who uh, right now is fighting to put resources. Bobby, thank you for being here on the front end to prevent the onset of violence because our young people need, they need opportunity. And so Congressman Bobby Scott, Chairman Bobby Scott continues to fight that battle as chair of the Education and Labor Committee and has been all of his life. The third reconstruction agenda, uh, you know what it's about, quite frankly, and it's about to confront systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, the denial of health care, militarism, and the devastating consequences of oppression, for starters. And uh, Congresswoman Jayapal, myself, uh, and our members, Congressman, Chairman Bobby Scott and um, Ro Khanna are so proud to be part of this movement, to be part of the movement to build power for the voices of those who have not been able to share power because of the power structure in this country. And so we were proud to introduce HRES 438 which is the third reconstruction. And I'm telling you, it's really an honor to work with you because it is an agenda to heal the nation, to end poverty and low wages from the bottom up, from the people up, which is how this country should work. So thank you again. I look forward to the testimony. Just know that this is your capital. Your capital. This is your capital. <laughs> and uh, we're so excited to be with you today. And thank you all for continuing to show up and have a wonderful march and rally on Saturday. I know. The power of the people is going to be shown throughout the world on Saturday. So thank you very much for being here today and giving us a preview of Saturday. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Pramila Jayapal. I'm proud to be the chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Um, I am so grateful to my friend, to somebody who's inspired me, actually, inspired me to run for office because I saw her courage. Uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee has just been such a champion for poor people um, as the head of that task force. But also don't forget, she's chair emeritus of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. And uh, we cannot thank her enough for her leadership. Also wanna just say uh, thank you so much to Chairman Bobby Scott. I serve on the Education and Labor Committee. A lot of the issues that are in our resolution have to do with that fundamental issue of education, of workers' rights, and Chairman Scott has been a fabulous champion on these issues. I wanna also thank um, uh, Ro Khanna, Congressman Ro Khanna, who has really been at the forefront of some of the big discussions around economic opportunity, bringing in economists to talk to us about how we create a truly equal society a real champion for working people. And of course, Sarah Jacobs has just joined us, also a member of the Progressive Caucus. Um, and really, when you talk about foreign policy, Sarah is somebody that I go to constantly because she has worked um, on mediation in the international realm. She understands and has been a voice for cutting that, uh, that Pentagon budget and very important on the Armed Services Committee. So really delighted to have you all here. And also thank you, um, John, thank you, Bishop Barber, thank you, Shally, thank you, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, and most of all, thank you to all of you who are here to share your stories today. Um, you come from all over the country. Your presence here is the presence of justice. Your presence here is the presence of story. Your presence here is the grounding of what we are fighting for in the real experiences of poor people across this country. And I cannot thank you enough for that. This is an essential briefing um, hosted by the Poor People's Campaign and uh, the Congressional Progressive Caucus and other partners about what we need to do to address the specific crises that affect our poor and low income communities across the country. And I think you will hear today the stories of regular people on the ground who are struggling. And this is the thing, they don't need to be. Poverty is a choice. It is a policy choice. And our task is to make different choices and to end poverty in this country of such great, tremendous wealth. 
We know that we're in a crisis of mass inequality in our country and that the gap between rich and poor has only continued to widen. We know that the global pandemic just exacerbated and worsened this inequality. And while millions of workers found themselves without a job, without a paycheck, and without health care, the billionaire class got wealthier. In fact, billionaire's wealth has risen more since the pandemic began than it has in the past 14 years, with the world's 10 richest men, some of whom live in my state, more than doubling their future over the course of the pandemic. As of 2020, 37.2 million people in America living in poverty, 120 million poor and low wealth people in the wealthiest country in the world with all the resources at our disposal. So our task here is to build our movement. I'm a lifelong organizer, I'm an activist, and I believe that the power comes from the people. And that is what the Poor People's Campaign has been showing us over and over again. That is what you will show on Saturday with a mass mobilization, a mass movement of people who are ready to tell the story of how this poverty is unacceptable. And that's why Congresswoman Lee and I are so proud to co-lead the introduction of the Third Reconstruction, a resolution that is comprehensive in nature and that goes into all the different pieces of what it takes to create a just and equitable society. So I wanna again say how proud I am to be here with you, the people who are changing the narrative, who are putting forward a transformational vision. And whenever somebody asks me what it means to be a progressive, I always say being progressive is just being first to the best and most just idea. And then everybody else has to run to catch up with us because what we're talking about is not really about progressive policy, just about justice. So thank you all so much. Thank you, um, Congresswoman Lee, Congresswoman Jayapal, um, for welcoming us and for opening up our congressional briefing. Um, we will now hear from our national co-chairs of the Poor People's Campaign, uh, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris and Bishop William Barber II. Um, we'll give Bishop Barber just a minute to, uh, to get settled, okay. Uh, we can also move the microphone down. There we go. Perfect. We will see you up here. Um, Let me thank all of you for being here today and um, all of the congresspersons that have gathered to hear these powerful voices, but not only to hear them, but take them to heart. I've been asked today by two congresspersons, would you rather we fight or would you rather we win? And I said, why is that the question? Because as far as I look in history, we never won what we didn't fight for. Right. Right. And we could never allow the debate to dumb down what we were fighting for, because then when we won, we would end up with less and have to keep fighting again. I went back this week and read the original text of the Civil Rights Act of 64. And it was so different from what was passed, which is why John Lewis, of all people, at the March on Washington, said to the Kennedy administration, the Democrats and Republicans, it wasn't enough. One of the lines he said is this bill does not go far enough to deal with the poverty that's in Appalachia or the poverty that's in Mississippi. John Lewis. 
we understand that decisions have to be made, but there comes a time that a nation has got to say, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all is non-negotiable. And you've got to at least fight all the way for what's needed. You know, right now we're about to, we got a, we allowed the voting rights bill to be watered down from what the house passed. And then the person that watered it down didn't even pass for the watered down part. <laughs> we allowed, we saw 49 Republicans and two Democrats say no to 32 million Americans. I remember the night, Brother Scott, I called you about the living wage bill and said, fight, get past it in the house like it should be. And don't lower the standard. We'll keep fighting because we know history. Sometimes it takes five, 10 years. It took 10 years to get Civil Rights Act 64 and Voting Rights Act 65. But the difference was they had a movement along with it. Uh, it took us from 1896 to 1954 to overturn Brown. Thank God that Somebody didn't say, well, you know, a little Jim Crow would be all right. I said one day to a person in Washington, D.C., they didn't like it. I said, there's some people that I'm glad they weren't negotiating doing slavery. Do all we would have gotten would have been a, a long weekend. <clears throat> I'm very serious. Because my remarks are short. I want to hear, have they already? Yeah. I want to hear from all these folks. Here's the question I want us to wrestle with. Are we going to sit and watch the downfall totally of this American experience of this democracy? And what I mean by that, there's a book that says America After Capitalism, and it argues that as long as you have 43, 50% of your people living in poverty, you're never going to really deal with the economic trends. You're going to constantly be on a roller coaster because, you, because the very fact that you don't do living wages and haven't had universal health care and don't guarantee certain things, that actually incites inflation. And then when the inflation happens, the very people who have the least end up hurting the most, and the people who have the most get bargains during inflation, and they get more. And as long as we are stuck in what the Pope said, are two evil forms of economics, trickle-down and neoliberalism. The Pope says that those are tricks, and they take democracy, they take the world backwards. And so we're here this weekend from all over the country, people who normally don't come together, at least the media doesn't show them together, black and white, women from Appalachia, black women from Alabama, farmers from Kansas with fast food workers, to say this is a declaration. Our Native American brothers and sisters and our Asian brothers and sisters saying, this weekend is not a march. It's not just, just having a nice conversation for everybody to say, well, I grew up poor. I, I get tired of hearing that from people. Well, you know, I grew up poor, I have sympathy. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is this democracy cannot sustain the tension of 140 million people living in poverty and low wealth, and 52% of our children in the wealthiest nation on the face of the earth. It can't. Eventually, that's going to implode. It's going to be a breeding ground for autocrats and demagogues. And if you think January the 6th was something, wait until poor and low wealth folk lose hope. And Republicans and Democrats need to hear that. If that ever happened, I don't even want to be around because the most moral people in this country are poor and low wealth folk who get kicked in the teeth by systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, denial of health care, the war economy, the false moral narrative of religious nationalism, and they still love America. And they still have some spirituality. And they still believe in the possibility of change. If that ever changes, we're in a world of hurt. And the last thing I want to ask, because many of these folks are our friends, but we got to get, while we're marching and moving and, and, we're, and we're not stopping with Saturday, what we're saying is, so it's clear and I'm through, Saturday 
is the two-year warning. And if we are meeting the fourth and fifth steps of the step to all-out nonviolent civil disobedience in love. The fourth and fifth steps are you have to make sure your adversary knows what you want, and you got to give them a chance to move, and then you got to make sure that you're doing it for all the right reasons. If in two years there's not some significant movement in this country on living wages and universal health care and those things, we're coming back here and in every country street, country road, city street, and engage in all out nonviolent action because we can't be silent anymore. Imagine what would be happening today in the Congress if 43% of the middle class suddenly fell out of the middle class. Imagine what would be happening today in the Congress if 43% of wealthy people suddenly fell out of wealth. Well, that's what's happened. 43% of this country is poor and no wealth. Imagine what would be the conversation if, if middle class folk were dying at a rate of 700 a day and a quarter million a, a year. That's what was happening before COVID to poor folk. Imagine what kind of crisis we would have if wealthy folk had died at a rate of two to five times higher than everybody else in this society during COVID. Well, that's what happened to poor folk. Imagine what kind of presidential summits we would be having and congressional uh, gatherings we would have if it was proven that everybody that had health care, they 330,000 people died from COVID because they have health care. Well, on Monday, we just found out 330,000 people died because this country doesn't have health care for everybody. And we attach health care to your job and not to your humanity. We are talking about life or death now, y'all. This ain't no more cute conversation. This is about whether this country is going to write off 43% of its people to just die. Policy got us here. And policy can get us out of here. And the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. We won't be silent or unheard anymore. Good afternoon. It just does not have to be this way. Poverty anywhere, including in this, the richest country in the history of the world. It does not have to be this way. The solutions are known. The answers are at hand. The policies are ready to be passed. And so, as we heard, any nation that chooses not to lift 140 million people out of poverty and low incomes, any nation that chooses to, to disenfranchise voters, to withstand the greatest attack on voting rights since right after the Civil War. Any nation that allows the poor to be hurt first and worst by ecological devastation and the denial of health care, any nation that purports itself in the name of national security to declare war is a declaration of war on the poor. I'm ready to listen. We have our demands clear. And as we heard, somebody's been hurting our people for far too long and we won't be silent anymore. Congresswoman Lee and John Paul, we want to thank you all for sponsoring that resolution. 
third reconstruction ending poverty and low wealth in America from the bottom up. And for many here who signed on to it, <clears throat> because without the resolve, we'll never get the results. And that's the first time in history that kind of comprehensive resolution has been put on the floor and got 30 some signatures. We make you a promise today. Before we get through, you're going to get some help. We're going to shake this nation. We got 43 state coordinating committees, 300 partners, 20 denominations, and most of all, the baddest freedom fighters anywhere. Because we got, we got black folk, our white folk, we got Asian, we got Native American, and we're going to do it with love and justice, but we're going to do it. And every time we get denied, it's going to only serve to intensify and embolden our, our agitation. And lastly, we now represent 34% of the electorate, poor folk, and 45% in battleground states. Make sure your colleagues know these are friends. I'm giving this and tell their colleagues. Because in 15 states, 1 to 25% more of poor and low wealth people voting can fundamentally shift to every election. A lot of states we call red states are not. And lastly, poor folk are not voting against their own interests. 53% of poor and low wealth folk voted even for the current administration. Most poor folk don't vote because nobody talks to them. You listen at a president, last time you heard a presidential debate that a presidential candidate was asked, if you, you be the president, how are you gonna deal with poverty and low wealth? Or a Senate candidate? That's the problem. The debate doesn't even include people, but it will because folk like this and the more than 500 buses now that are coming and folk that are walking from Maryland and walking from Virginia and others that are coming are not coming for a day. Am I right? But coming for a declaration. So help is coming. Help is coming. Help is here. And we don't intend to quit because if we quit, the soul of this nation will utterly fail. It will. It can't stand this the way it is now. Love you all. God bless you. So we will now hear from uh, our first six um, testifiers. Uh, Dante Sharp um, from North Carolina, who will speak on voting rights and incarceration. Aaron Scott from Washington, who will speak on rural poverty in America. Guadalupe de la Cruz, who will speak on immigration uh, and is from Florida. Catherine Joswick from West Virginia and the pollution that her community is facing. Vanessa Noisy of the Apache Stronghold on their struggles to save Oak Flat in Arizona, and Kyle Bibby, a veteran um, on the war economy from New Jersey. And as Reverend Barber um, and Reverend Liz have said, we are also joined today by testifiers online who we will be hearing from and, and many of our leaders from West Virginia, from Maine, from Mississippi, from West Virginia, uh, from, um, from Washington, D.C., and uh, from Arizona, from all across this country. There are thousands of people who are watching us online. There are thousands more who are coming, uh, who are coming to DC this weekend, and there are hundreds and thousands more who are ready to throw down. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dante Sharp, and I'm proud to join this powerful movement. For 26 years, from the age of 18 to 44, I was in prison wrongfully by the state of North Carolina for a crime of which I did not commit. I have to write a book about what I saw and experienced when I was in prison. Um, it's cool and it's not working. Um, I went through a lot mentally, emotionally, and physically, and uh, it's tearing families apart. I'm struggling with my family now. You know, trying to get back to school. And I get emotional when I talk about the struggle with me and mine. All right, y'all. Y'all true, brother. Me and my family. And uh, 
it affect the community too and the dignity of you know my my family and uh, that's why when I was exonerated and I got pardoned, I made a promise that the rest of my life I was gonna fight for God. I left behind. I stole all the stories I do. And uh, I promised them that uh, I was in, you know, go down fight. You know, my fight won't over just because I got out and I left them. You know, I still have guys calling me from prison now. Their wife and family contacting me and asking me for help. And I really feel helpless because I can't do nothing. And uh, on the way over here today, uh, I was walking. Katie was showing me the Supreme Court buildings and things like that. And I didn't have no emotions about it. I thought I'd be excited to see it, but I, in prison, we lost, we, we, we lost all confidence in the system, you know, especially being wrongfully convicted, you know, because you know you're in there, you shouldn't be in there. And um, it was a struggle just to walk by there and look and struggle with myself to say, I'm going to have to go up here and face, even though what happened to me going up and down in the court system, all the way up to the Supreme Court, and getting denied, you know, feeling hurt and heartbroken for all those years. But I still had to walk by faith and come up here and believe that what we said in here today would touch hearts and break some yokes and help set people free and tear down some you know strongholds. So I have two things I want to share. The prior is for me as a fellow before justice for the last two years, that I had my freedom, my fault for the Lord, vote dignity and life of people who are currently and formerly incarcerated in this country. So what needs to be done now is Congress must. Is, is unlock our vote because of our work striking down a racist felony disenfranchisement law more than 50,000 new voters will be able to participate in elections in November in our state of North Carolina. We don't believe you should ever have the right to vote taken away. The right to restoration for anyone living in the community should be the federal standard immediately because it's important. It's emergency. If you're living in the community, your kids should are going to school, you're paying tax taxes, you should be able to have say in the law that will govern your life. You know, uh, you should be able to vote for judges, district attorneys, school boards, and members of Congress like you are. You know, uh, in prison, people just don't have confidence. I mean, once you've been in prison and went through a system, if you had any confidence in the system, the criminal justice, our whole system, uh, voting, it's shot. That's all we talk about in there. That's all we talk about. People think that voting, it really is set up in prison. It's hard to really convince a man or woman that's been convicted and been in prison to get out and vote. They think it's, it's real. And second, we need to invest in mental health care services now and begin to support the people returning to society at a certain time. It's a more imperative because I'm mentally going through a lot now since I've been, I haven't been home three, three years yet. And that doesn't hold the candle to 26 years. Wow. You know, I did more free time in prison than I have in society for a crime I didn't do. Mm -hmm. Had to fight with a bunch of people like Reverend Bob, full justice do. Everybody took a billion to get me out. And like I say, if, if nothing else gonna happen here today, I pray that I hope that y'all hear me and I believe my faith that y'all hear me. Everybody hear me, whoever will see you, hear all of us and, and that things will change, you know, for me and all of us here. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Erin Scott. I'm a single father. I'm transgender. I'm from a working poor family in rural upstate New York. And for the past eight years, I've helped pastor a rural, poor, mostly white community in Grays Harbor County, Washington State. And when the timber industry left Grays Harbor County, it took the jobs with it. There hasn't really been a replacement economy except to build a prison and expand local incarceration. A lot of our people die young from overdoses, from being homeless in the winter, police brutality, suicide, all of which ties back to poverty and to lack of access to health care. I do the work that I do because I don't want people left on their own to battle with this system the way my family was. Nine years ago, I lost the most important man in my life, my grandfather. He was a veteran of the United States military who fell into a mental health crisis. It was easy, it was easier for him 
to get a hold of a gun than it was for him to get the mental health care that he needed. I remember my grandma fighting with all different doctor's offices in the living room, desperately trying to get him in to get seen somewhere. And he died by suicide in the garage. My grandma found him. And I am here today to ask, where was the support from this government that my grandpa proudly served his whole life when he needed you? And where was the support from my grandma, his widow? You left us on our own. It was my teenage cousin and my disabled aunt who took care of grandma in the night when she would wake up screaming. And it was a younger veteran who lived across the street that came and pressure washed grandpa's blood off the garage wall so that we wouldn't have to. He said it was an honor to help our family. And I'm asking you to honor the memory of my grandparents, Leland and Ivy Scott, to honor poor and abandoned young people all over this country by making it possible for everyone in this country to get the health care we need, including mental health care, regardless of our income, ability, immigration, or carceral status. Hundreds of rural hospitals in particular have been closed, and over 400 more are about to close. That's 25% of the rural hospitals in this country about to be closed because they're not profitable. And I'm asking you to make sure that we have good jobs, living wages, and guaranteed incomes we aren't poor because we're lazy. We're poor because the laws and policies in this country are stacked against us. And if that can't be done right now, right in this moment, then make sure we can vote to get people in there who can and will make it happen. The Bible says, woe to those who make unjust laws, though to those who issue oppressive decrees to deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of my people making widows their prey, and robbing the fatherless. What will you do on the day of reckoning when disaster comes from afar? To whom will you run for help? And I'll just close by saying God is watching all the time, not just during election cycles, and so are we. Thank you. And good afternoon. My name is Guadalupe de la Cruz. I am the Florida Director for American Friends Service Committee. Um, I'm also one of the state chairs for the Florida Poor People's Campaign, and I've been organizing for immigrant rights in South Florida for the last 10 years. When, immigration, when immigrants come to my state, they are fleeing violence, war, and poverty. But what do, we find, what do they find when they arrive in the richest democracy in the world? They are turned away and told that they are criminals and don't deserve any rights. They are humiliated, shackled with ankle monitoring bracelets, and left to manage the immigration system on their own. Florida anti-immigrant and anti-democratic laws make conditions for immigrants particularly bad in my state. SB 168 prohibits my community from becoming a sanctuary for immigrants. SB 1808 fortifies the relationship between police and ICE. Our governor is blaming farm workers for the spread of COVID. Voter suppression laws make it even harder for immigrants who can vote to make the system work for us. Under a new anti-protest bill, HB1, we can't even express our voices against these assaults without the fear of being charged with felonies and incarcerated. Meanwhile, efforts to provide immigrant workers with living wages or even minimum wages to protect them from the heat-related illness are stalled. But we can't just blame Florida lawmakers. On any given day, tens of thousands of adults and children are held in more than 200 immigrant detention facilities nationwide. These centers are often built on polluted land, just like Homestead was in my hometown. And there are inadequate care and widespread medical abuses including forced sterilization and insufficient COVID precautions. U.S. taxpayers fund these inhumane facilities. In 2018 alone, the top center contractors 
of the five federal agencies responsible for immigrant detention and correction received over $2.3 billion in federal contracts. No one should be subject to these abuses, no matter what documents we carry, where we work, or where we come from. This is why I'm here in Washington. The US Congress must step up and protect people in Florida and other states where anti-immigrant forces have captured our democratic system. I'm gonna mention a few things that we want and we demand. And as I say this, I'm thinking of Silvia, whose husband was deported and she was left a single mother. I think of my brother who was deported and left three children here. I think of Angelina, who is a farm worker and she's over 50 years old and still picks the fields in Homestead. I think of these people, these are my friends, these are my families. We're celebrating today 10 years of DACA. That's 10 years of people still not having a pathway to citizenship. That's 10 years of people still being left in limbo. These are my friend Cynthia, who has had DACA for 10 years. This is my friend Ilse, who qualifies for DACA, but because it wasn't expanded, was not able to uh, apply for DACA. And here are some of the actions that you can take that would make a real difference to my friends and to my family. Pass the DREAM Act. Lift restrictions that prevent undocumented families from accessing critical social services. Enact federal protections guaranteeing everyone, regardless of their immigration status, a living wage, safe work conditions, the right to join unions, and to peacefully assemble and protest, and meaningful voting rights. Ensure that we all, that we all have access to affordable health care, regardless of our documentation status. Congress must also adopt an immigration policy that addresses the inhumane detention systems that allow us to live in, the, in, in work and dignity. We are already essential to the US economy. A path to citizenship would create an even bigger boost, increasing GDP by 1.7 trillion over the next decade, according to one recent study. For a nation of immigrants, the current situation is shameful and it's unacceptable. The American dream cannot come on the backs of immigrants and, for, and on poor people anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congresswoman John Paul Scott and me and Rokana are those who have sponsored every deal that would do the things that we call for. I'm good. What we are thankful today is that they would allow this hearing to go is so that we can get these voices on the record. And what we are also saying to you all is to say to folk who are serious about transformation, whenever they get, you get ready to pass bills from now on, we can bring these faces so that the bill is not just debated as a bill. You know, we, in other words, if you're gonna sponsor a bill, then call the campaign, we'll put the people behind you that then put a face on it right, a diverse face, whether it's voting rights or immigrant justice or whatever, because until we do that, if we keep debating just numbers, it doesn't have the moral mm, that's necessary to move, uh, um, and we don't want it to be Jayapal versus uh, um, McCarthy or McCarthy versus Jayapal, we want it to be, do you, are you against these people? <laughs> that's, and we can help in that way. I uh, want to say to the rest of the testifiers, just be mindful, we've got 12. And I know there's so much, but we want to make sure, what's the time limit we gave? Three minutes. Three minutes. And I, we don't have a time, but be very careful of that so that we can get, because some folks have to go to the floor at 5 o'clock and then others about 5.15. And I, I have to leave because I'm going to go to the meeting with the speaker, and I'm going to tell her about this. Uh, I know you don't have a place to stay, but I just want to say again, Okay, uh, let's see here. My name is uh, Catherine Joswick. I'm a resident of Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, a concerned mother and a PhD trained molecular biologist who studied pulmonary disorders for over 20 years. Never did I imagine that my professional and personal life would collide like they did in the summer of 2016 when our community discovered plans by the West Virginia state government to build a heavy industrial facility 
at the site of a historic apple orchard. It was to be the first in a thousand acre industrial park. There are many problems with this factory, including that the Rockwell Company was recruited and the factory approved in a process rife with improprieties at both the state and local levels. Public participation and engagement were circumvented through secretive and opaque processes, and the heavy industrial activities proposed at this site poses grave threats to our local environment. The most concerning aspect of this project is the location of the factory less than half a mile from the lowest poorest, lowest performing elementary school in our county, and within two miles of four other schools comprising 30% of our county students. Upon learning about this facility, hundreds of thousands of our county residents have pursued every possible legal and legislative remedy from filing lawsuits against various aspects of the project to voting out elected officials, even popular incumbents who brought this factory to our county. In addition to the local outcry, neighboring communities in Maryland and Virginia have issued formal statements of opposition to the factory. We've met with all local, state, and federal elected officials and representatives from the West Virginia Department of the um, Environmental Protection and the EPA. Several uh, county residents even purchased shares of Rockwell stock to try to affect change from the inside. Uh, but despite these Her Herculean efforts, the factory began operating in June 2021, and as feared, has already had numerous violations in their air and water permits. Area residents are now forced through community efforts to monitor their own air quality, well water, and local school children are endure enduring periodic heavy metal testing to provide early warning to county residents of del deleterious environmental effects of this factory. This isn't unique to West Virginia or to our community. This happens in communities across the United States every day, and we need your help when our officials' interests collide with the protection of our communities. And remember, pollution of air and water don't respect city or state boundaries. So our problem is your problem. And what we need now from you is to stand up for our rights and for our planet and even if it's not popular, or, or even if you don't think it's possible, we need you to stand up and protect our voting rights. Without strong protections for our voting rights or our right to assemble and protest, citizens will have even less of a say than we do now. Please support a just transition to a greener future, a Build Back Better plan. West Virginians and our natural resources have been exploited by corporations and wealthy individuals for centuries. We should not have to choose between our health and good paying jobs. No one in America should have to make that choice. Strengthen environmental regulations at the federal level. States like West Virginia are known to have weak environmental protections. Loopholes in federal regulations further uh, facilitate environmental exploitation of our communities. Guidelines like the one that the EPA has issued that you should not cite a school less than or less than half a mile from a factory, but yet you can still cite a factory next to a school, means that now our students will be exposed to toxic pollutants for up to 12 years of their academic life. We need stronger federal regulations to push back against the outsized influence of corporations and unscrupulous elected officials. We ask you to stand for us, even when it's not popular, and push forward these meaningful, necessary bills and legislation for the American people. Thank you. Hello, my name is Vanessa Nozzi. I'm Chiwaka Apache. I'm here to speak about our sacred and holy site, Chichibos Bagotil Oak Flat. I'm a member of the Apache Stronghold who has been who has been fighting a foreign mining corporation called Resolution Copper. 
I'm gonna give you a little history as fast as I can. The late in the late 90s is when they started lobbying, when they were reaching out to senators and Congress trying to gain support to allow a mining company to come in and mine the, the most copper ore in North America, the biggest copper ore in North America. It wasn't until 2002 when it was officially induced on the floor of uh, Gosar. Even then though, the, the Tonto National Forest Service where Chichibisagotil Oak Platt sits on, the Forest to Service told them no, do not do this because of the environment destruction that will happen there. What will happen to Nuggles Sun Mother Earth? They were against the whole mining issue. Congress, they didn't have Senate and Congress support. It wasn't until 2014 when the late Senator John McCain slipped it into the Midnight Rider, a National Defense Authorization Act, a bill that was a must sign bill. They stuck our holy site in that, in that bill to have it signed. And it was for the 2015 physical year. The current now is one, the Apache wars have not stopped. The war on indigenous people have not stopped. Our people are at the forefront. They, they had a campaign when the colonizers came and they told us let's kill the Indian but save the man. Now they cannot physically shoot us, but they are trying to kill our spirit. We as indigenous people are here to tell you, tell the first, the first thing that happened into this country. Tell the first chapter of how America was founded and the deceit behind it. Because now they are not only lying to the, that lied to the indigenous people, they lied to all people. The United States government did not reinvent the will. They put it on everyone. Now I stand here representing thousands and thousands of people of my ancestors that have passed before me, giving me the blessed gift to fight, to have a father who was former chairman of the St. Cross Apache tribe instill in me the abilities to fight and carry on that fight. I'm a mother of four girls and my job as an indigenous person is to pass on the religion, the spirituality, to my daughters so that they can pass it on to, to their future generations that they are gonna bear, that they're gonna have. I have my youngest daughter that is at the back of the hall. We're at a different fight for her. I'm as the mother is at a different fight for her because not only will her spirituality be taken away from her, if this foreign mining company can come in and destroy our holy site, she will no longer know what it is to be Apache. She's gonna have to not only fight for survival of the earth because the dewaterizing that is happening there now, Arizona is, in a, is beyond a mega drought. The numbers that they are telling you is wrong. Arizona is beyond a mega drought and we're in to edification, meaning no point in return. So our fight is not only a fight on religion, the freedom of religion that should be given to the first people, but also we are fighting at the forefront for all you people, because if the earth and the environment is destroyed, we will have nothing. Legislation just had a hearing on the Colorado River saying there is no water. All our fights here, I'm a descendant of a prisoner of war. We need to come together and unify. Help me protect my holy site because I'm helping you to survive. I'm helping you to survive and live for those yet to be born. <laughs> let, let me just uh, say, I, I cannot produce, I, unfortunately, I have no other comment. And I just want to thank you for being here because your, your words, your testimony inspire us because this is me if you know how tough this place is. But what you are doing, what you're saying today and bearing witness to what this country must do uh, really uh, keep us uh, on the right track and keep us going. So we're going to lift up the HR 438 even more. So we're going to get that back sooner or later. And thank you for that. And Bishop, you said something about someone said to, to uh, fight or do we want to win? Well, I, I say when we fight, we win. And that's what yes. we're doing. So thank you all very much. God bless. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you. All right.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kyle Bibby. I'm the National Campaigns Manager for Common Defense. Common Defense is the nation's largest veteran-led grassroots organization. I'm a U.S. Naval Academy graduate, a former Marine Corps captain. I served seven years in the infantry, and I'm an Af Afghanistan war veteran. After my time in the military, uh, I worked at the Office of Management and Budget during the last few years of the Obama administration. And the first lesson I learned in that role was that our national budget reflects our priorities. As a former military officer and government program analyst, I witnessed firsthand how our national priorities have left millions behind. Our military receives almost half of the annual discretionary funds allotted by Congress, and year after year, we effortlessly increase that same budget. Over the past 20 years, our government has spent over $8 trillion on the global war on terror, and during that same time, we spent more than $21 trillion on militarizing our nation internationally and domestically. The budget hearings for the Department of Defense focus on political geography, power politics, and of course, supporting the troops. This misses the real toll and effect war has on our uniformed service members. Despite the trillions we put into our military, everyday veterans like me don't see the benefit. More meaningful numbers for us is the number 22. For years, war veterans were told that 22 veterans were committing suicide a day. As we scrambled to build the networks necessary to respond to this crisis, many of us began to speak louder about the ongoing costs of war here in the United States. The pain that leads to suicide does not appear out of thin air. Every veteran can repeat the names of friends and allies whose personal torment came from the same wars that we overfunded and underinterrogated. Mm. Even worse, these wars came with an opportunity cost of meaningful growth and investment in the communities that we serve. Every day that we continue with a budget that prioritizes war is a day that American service members are asked to recommit to that cycle of trauma. And as a nation, we never reckon with the harm that we put on communities overseas who did not volunteer to join the world's premier fighting force. Instead, they were born on contested land. When I speak to fellow veterans, some of the hardest moments are tied to the families and children we lived with in these war zones. The cost and grief of the forever wars is incalculable. And for decades, we've pushed these costs of war beyond our vision. But the costs are right in front of us. Every dollar that we spend destroying communities overseas is a dollar not spent on universal health care, affordable housing, meaningful social services, or investing in our youth. And every youth sent overseas for war is a life at risk for a sacrifice that we cannot justify. Every veteran returning who is saddled with trauma is a high toll to pay for wars that never had a clear goal. And many of us are returning to underfunded and forgotten communities. I'm here today with the Poor People's Campaign because we can make different choices and we need you to make different choices. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask um, the congressman who are present, is it uh, just in the interest of time, if we could move directly to our virtual testifiers and then uh, hold questions or comments for after they, is that okay? I'm, okay. Um, so uh, at this point, we'll hear from uh, five people who are joining us virtually. Um, Kenya Slaughter from Louisiana, who's been organizing at Dollar General. Morgan Levy from Texas, who's one of Starbucks United. Fernando Garcia from the southern border of Texas. Jessica Boyles from Pennsylvania on being a home health care worker in a pandemic. And Reverend Carolyn Foster from Alabama on voting rights and health care. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kenya Slaughter. I currently reside in Alexandria, Louisiana. Um, I've been employed with Dollar General for the last four years, and I'm also a mom to a child with special needs. My daughter is on the spectrum. Uh, she definitely needs special attention and care. During the pandemic, I closed the store many nights, so I know my store's revenue was going up, but we didn't get paid more. Um, in fact, we often worked alone without any PPE, while more than 300 customers would come in looking for whatever they were looking for or needed. And at one point we were going to get a $300 one-time bonus, but that didn't begin to compensate for all of the risk we were taking. 
Um, many of our stores have been robbed at good point, including the one that I currently work at. Um, during the night shift with just one or two people, and they're usually women. Um, more recently, uh, I and several other Dollar General workers, shareholders, were turned away from the shareholders meeting on May 26. This was at the City Hall in Goodlettsville, Tennessee. I was with the Honorable Reverend uh, William Barber and other workers, and we had a proxy to enter. We knocked and we were ignored. We were told we were denied entry because we were four minutes late. Nowhere on the proxy does it state a time frame for entry into the building. And we had been on the property since 7.30 a.m. rallying with our band. Um, the meeting began at 9 a.m. We entered the building at 9.04 and were denied entry into the meeting that we rightfully should have been able to attend. Uh, the concerns that we wanted to address were things like having work and AC in our stores, um, weekly COVID testing, safer working conditions and better wages. Uh, Dollar General makes more than enough money to provide better wages for all of its employees, uh, as well as especially its essential workers. You know, we're on the front lines. Um, it's the nation's fastest growing retail chain with $3.2 in profit in 2021, but they have not shared the wealth with their employees. In 2021, their CEO, Mr. Todd Bezos, um, made $16.6 million which is 935 times as much as the firm's medium worker pay of just $17,773. It's a big gap, 16.6 million to 17,000. Dollar General is also, also intensely anti-union. They've even shut down stores that have um, voted to be represented by a labor union. I really believe that the people, these corporate executives, they try to fit us into their budget and accounting but we are not, and we're more than numbers on a spreadsheet to be pushed around until we make sense on paper. Um, we can't get done what they are asking of us in the tiny amount of hours that they believe that it takes. We can't live off poverty wages, and we can't live in constant fear with threat to our lives. And this is why we're organizing and asking for better pay, safer working conditions, and for corporations like Dollar General to pay their fair share. And that's why we're asking you to be accountable to us, not to them. Thank you so much for having me. I do wanna, I wanna ask the following speakers to try to keep your remarks at two minutes and 30. I know it's hard, but we want to give some time to the congressperson and we don't want to get past 520 because we have a hard stop at 530. So go right to the heart of the matter. Go right to the heart of the matter and, and, and we're very powerful, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Morgan Levy, BSW. I am a barista and union organizer at the 45th and Lamar Starbucks in Austin, Texas. Everyone knows um, Starbucks <laughs> and that they seem to be a progressive company, but what people don't often see is the low quality of life workers have regardless of Starbucks curated image. Many partners live paycheck to paycheck and work one or more side jobs to make ends meet. If you try to ask for over 30 hours a week, it's never guaranteed, especially since the nationwide labor cuts that Starbucks issued back in the late winter. Sure, Starbucks offers health care for partners who work an average of 20 hours a week, but many partners can't afford that cut to their paycheck every month for coverage. So many of us never get a break from the cycle. We never get to breathe financially. We are always looking for a new side hustle or staring into the black hole of student loans. We are burning out. <laughs> Um, two weeks ago, my store became the first unionized Starbucks store in the state of Texas. Uh, Starbucks partners across the nation have been organizing with Workers United. And as of yesterday, we have reached 150 unionized stores with over 300 NLRB petitions. Unfortunately, Starbucks has been aggressively anti-union throughout this process. They have illegally fired organizing partners across the country. They're now closing stores. They're enforcing dress code and attendance policies that were not enforced prior. Um, they have cornered partners, um, threatened their trans-affirming health care or education benefits through ASU, and so much more. Um, interim CEO Howard Schultz publicly announced on New York Times Dealbook the other day that Starbucks will never engage with the union. Why is he able to get away with that? We need to pass the PRO Act. We need to hold corporations legally, morally, and financially accountable for union busting. 
We need affordable health care options too. So if our company doesn't provide it, we have real options. I myself have been uninsured since September because I can't afford public health care. We need at the least a $15 federal minimum wage. Organizing Starbucks partners made our company-wide $15 minimum wage increase this summer possible. If a bunch of mostly young adults with little to no organizing experience can put enough pressure on a multi-billion dollar company to raise the minimum wage in less than a year, we absolutely expect our government to be able to do so too. Baristas at Starbucks don't just pour coffee. We are skilled service workers that make Starbucks ever-growing profits possible. Many of us are artists, doctors, teachers, and social workers in the making. We are students, graduates, parents, and veterans. We deserve livable wages, affordable health care, student loan forgiveness, and protection for our civil right to organize with the union. With Starbucks billions, Starbucks workers should not be poor people. Thank you to the Poor People's Campaign for inviting me here today, and thank you to those who have been fighting for us already. Hi, I'm Fernando Garcia. I'm the founder and current ex executive director of uh, the Border Network for Human Rights. Today, I'm speaking in behalf of thousands of mixed legal status families, border residents, and U.S. citizens that are part of the Border Network for Human Rights. For decades, immigrant families and border communities in America have been subjected to a brutal combination of systems that dehumanize us, persecute us, criminalize us, and kill us. Our immigration system has separated more than 2,000 children from their parents at the border since 2017. It has expelled almost 1 million and a half refugees and asylum seekers in the last two years. It has built more than 1,000 miles of border walls and also has sent migrants to isolated deserts and mountains in our border where they are dying at a, at a rate of 1,000 per year. That means three, three migrants dying every day. It has pushed 11 million of immigrants in, in the United States to live in poverty and ongoing persecution. And all of this is rooted and perpetuated by a distorted narrative that has infused vitriol and racism and white supremacy in our immigration system. I recently spent more than three weeks along the Texas border, Mexico-Texas border, and saw how the state of Texas has become the epicenter of the white supremacy aggression against democracy, women, immigrants, refugee families, people of color, and the poor. The so-called Lone Star Operation spearheaded by Republican Governor Greg Abbott has spent more than $8 billion of taxpayer money to build a state border walls and deployed thousands of state troopers and Texas National Guards to the border with the purpose of arresting and detaining migrant children, migrant families, and refugees. We refuse to accept this culture of abuse, terror, and poverty. And we reaffirm that the southern border of the United States could become the New Orleans Island. We call on Congress and on the Biden administration to end the anti-refugee strategies at the border, such as Title 42, MPP, family detention, and family separation, and instead rebuild and strengthen a fair and humane asylum and refugee system. To end the militarization of the border and the, constructions of, the construction of border walls, and instead create welcoming centers and expand legal ways where families, workers, and refugees can come to America free of violence and abuse, to make Border Patrol, ICE, and other immigration law enforcement agencies and institutions accountable to Congress and to our communities, and to infuse them with a theory and practice of human and civil rights. And finally, very importantly, to reform our immigration laws and reunify families and allow 11 million undocumented Americans that live in the United States to be integrated and recognized as citizens with dignity and rights. I thank you for your attention. My name is Jessica. I live in Wayne County, a rural part of Northeast Pennsylvania, and I'm a home health care aide. I'm also a leader with Put People First PA, 
and the Pennsylvania Poor People's Campaign. When the pandemic hit, I was an essential healthcare worker, but I also had no health insurance. Wow. And at $11 an hour, I made too much for Medicaid, but not enough to buy private insurance. I looked for a new job and the best I could find was an agency requiring a full year of employment before my benefits kicked in. Because I was desperate, I took that job and I worked that year only to find that my benefits were so low and the deductible so high that I couldn't actually afford to use them. Across the country, the median hourly wage for home health and personal care aides is just $14.15. And even with these low wages, employ employers continue to cut corners. I'd like to tell you about Richard, an 84-year-old client, former client of mine who requires 24-hour care. When an agency takes a case, they are legally required to fill all of the hours. And that never happened in the six months I was on Richard's case. He was routinely and knowingly left without a caretaker for over eight hours. I watched multiple coworkers burn themselves out and quit trying to meet these unfilled hours. I would stop in as often as I could to get him to the bathroom and out of his soiled clothes, which were causing him urine burns. But I lived with guilt every time I chose to take care of myself rather than fill in extra hours for Richard. How do people expect workers to show up under these demoralizing conditions when we can't even get our own health care to take care of ourselves? Oh. At the same time, the health care and home care CEOs are profiting off of our pain. Last year, the CEO of Humana, which owns the country's largest home care agency, made 16 and a half million. That's 561 times more than a typical home care worker, a typical Jessica. People who need care and the people who provide that care are struggling just to survive, while people at the top are raking in record profits. Something is very wrong, yet our political leaders consistently blame the poor and tell us that we're lazy, uh -huh. looking for handouts and draining the system, when the truth is the exact opposite. The system is structured so that those at the top holding the levers of power are the ones draining it and the poor pay the price with our lives while also taking the blame. It's shameful and we're angry. That's why the Poor People's Campaign declares that healthcare is a human right and it's a public good. And it's why we're demanding high quality healthcare for everyone, regardless of income, documentation status or geography now. It's why we're demanding a federal minimum wage of $15 an hour now. It's why we're demanding that corporations pay their fair share of taxes now. It's why we're asking you to place the poor at the center of federal policies, not the periphery. It is the only way forward. Thank you. I am Reverend Carolyn Foster. I serve a small inner city Episcopal church in Birmingham, Alabama. I am one of the chairs for the Alabama Poor People's Campaign, and I serve on staff of a nonprofit organization that serves the five county areas surrounding Birmingham called Greater Birmingham Ministries. We provide direct services to people who are hurting and at risk due to economic constraints and we work to dismantle issues that are systemic in nature that keep people needing basic services such as food, clothing, and financial assistance. As an example, people come to us on food distribution day because they have children who are hungry. We have learned that most of the time their hunger need can be traced to a policy mm -hmm. or a systemic problem that is an obstacle or a barrier to them, such as lack of living wage. People wouldn't come to us needing food to feed their children or needing money to pay their utility bills or to purchase medication if they had a living wage and affordable health care insurance. And if these people, many of them who are the working poor, had a fair and just election process, they would elect people who are truly, who truly represent them, 
and their interests. Lack of a living wage, lack of Medicaid expansion, and barriers to voting are huge obstacles in Alabama. Alabama still has not expanded Medicaid, even though federal funds are made available for it to happen. Even though 100,000 Alabamians who hold regular jobs, albeit low wage jobs, mm -hmm. would benefit from it. 300,000 people in Alabama would benefit from the expansion of Medicaid. They are the uninsured veterans. They are adult college students. They are people with disabilities. They are children, uh, adults who take care of children and older family members. And they are workers who are in between jobs. There are great moral and economic costs to not providing for the health care and well-being of people in Alabama and across this country. A recent study shows that universal health care could have saved over 330,000 lives during the pandemic. We are so quick to run to war, to defend the rights of the powerful, and where is that urgency to address the lack of health care, decent and adequate income, or democracy? Legislators and officials are elected to represent all the people in their districts. But when the vote is suppressed right. by purging eligible voters, when thousands of people are disenfranchised because of fines and fees and cumbersome, unnecessary paperwork that must be completed before you can cast your vote, then it is blatantly obvious that obstacles are in place for some of us, but not all of us. Organizations like Greater Birmingham Ministries can only do so much right. to provide temporary relief to people who are in great need, who are vulnerable, who are disenfranchised, and sometimes targeted by legislation and policies that Thank undermine you. their very existence. Thank you so much, Carol. We're gonna, we have to, we have to, because we've got about seven minutes, but you said something that we want the uh, Congressman Scott and Congressman O'Connor. We're hoping that you all will take the link of this and send it to all Congress, Republicans and Democrats. And then what we wanna make a commitment to you is when you all are debating, let's just say on either side, the Senate or the House, imagine if you were doing a healthcare piece and you had the lady who's a healthcare worker, a thousand of her in the hearing room, right? And you had black and white and brown and Asian. That's what we wanna help do. We understand this can be a cynical place. We understand sometimes y'all do the damnedest you can do, but we think there's an added moral dimension. And that is, you know, when we, if we know the bill is coming up in hearing, we pack it out. We make sure every Republican and Democrat got somebody from their state in that room that's impacted. And then when it's debated on the floor, we are all up in the gallery. Now we may not win the first couple of times, but I guarantee you that'll be a different kind of conversation rather than it just being the Democrats wanna do this and the Republicans wanna do this. This is the same delegation that you all share the White House. We wanna meet with them and our economists because if this vo these voices are the only voices that can turn the mindset and create the kind of movements that can make possible legislation, as you know the history very well, and I'll stop here. Lyndon Baines Johnson, Republicans, Democrats, nobody was planning on having a, a Voting Rights Act. But the people in the street changed the dynamic, changed the conversation and created the room. We wanna create room. We wanna break open the discussion. We wanna make sure when somebody stands against it, right there, you got Pam Garrison. You having some problems in West Virginia, call us and let us put 2,500 West Virginians in, in, the, in, in the room beside their senator or their representative. That's the difference that we wanna change around this place. Cause for us, it's about life and death. Am I right y'all? <laughs> and we won't be what? Yeah. Great, yes. Uh, Congressman Scott and Congressman Connor are still here. Congressman Connor has agreed to close us out. So um, 
And I'll never forget the day, the day that the Poor People's Campaign was launched, Congressman Khanna was there, reminded us that his grandfather had been in the, in, in the Indian independence movement, had spent years in jail. And he, like Congressman Scott, know the power of activism tied to, That's right. to elected officials. But Congressman Scott, who's in charge of health, labor, and education in the House, do you want to, do you have a question or anything you'd like to say? This is a good moment. And if you could say it into the microphone, here we are being live. Well, thank you, Reverend Barber and Poor People's Campaign. Thank you so much. Um, a lot has been said about uh, voting, and we've seen this in gun safety. Uh, when people start voting for gun safety, it's not gun safety they're interested in, it's political safety. When their seats start getting in jeopardy, then they have an interest in the issue. And what uh, Bishop, you've talked about is the political implications in a lot of these closed states. People are going to make different calculations as to what they're going to have to uh, pay attention to. Uh, the, I, I chair the Education and Labor Committee. A lot of other committees are doing the temporary support and health care, and the fact that people haven't expanded Medicaid is a disgrace because most states will make a profit because there's so much federal subsidy on it that the little bit they have to pay, they're going to be covering th things they're paying with state money, and by the time whoever they've given the money to spends the money, they're going to tax it and get back more than they put out. So the fact that they have denied the hundreds of thousands of people health care by not expanding Medicaid is something that um, we need to make sure that they appreciate how we feel about it uh, at the polls. But uh, there are a lot of issues that we're dealing with. Housing is one. Uh, housing is closely related, obviously, with poverty, but also with wealth. The quickest way to middle class is home ownership, and we need to make sure that's that that's on the table. But there are a lot of issues within the jurisdiction of the Ed and Labor Committee that we're that we're dealing with. Uh, Bishop mentioned the minimum wage bill. Uh, we need 218 to pass a bill. We've got about 214, 215 that aren't thinking about ever voting to increase the minimum wage, and we got to get to 218 out of the rest. And there are a lot of people running around in the dark trying to sabotage it but we were able to pass it once and then get it in Build Back Better and pass it again. Uh, so it, it can pass the House, and we're still, still, we haven't given up on it yet. Another thing that can help is good education. In K through 12, I was delighted in the American Rescue Plan. We put more money into K through 12 education in the history of the United States federal government in the American Rescue Plan, over $130 billion, and we distributed it according to the Title I formula where poverty was the biggest factor. The school systems that have been chronically overlooked, they got the most money. Uh, the wealthy areas are getting about $500 a student. The low-income areas are getting about $5,000 a student, some even a lot more than that. And so we put the money where, 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 where it's necessary. We're trying to make college more affordable. Uh, we're in the process of doubling the Pell Grant, reducing interest on student loans, and a lot of other things so that people can go to college. The executive branch is dealing with uh, student uh, loan discharge and forgiveness. That's We can't pass it, and it through, but they, whatever they're going to do, they're going to do. But we're working on ways to make college more affordable and make Pell Grants uh, accessible, not just to courses that lead to a college degree, but also those that lead to a good job uh, so that people can get a good education and get skills. Uh, we, the, if you're going to do well, you got to you got to join a union. We've been, had a lot of that. Um, I introduced the Pro Act. We got it out of the House, passed the House. Uh, so um, uh, we need to keep pushing on that. And finally, we have to enforce discrimination laws. If you're entitled, if you've worked and entitled to a, a, a job and qualified for a job, you shouldn't lose it because of discrimination. And we passed several uh, bills out of our committee on discrimination. So there's a lot we're working on. But the thing that's going to really make the difference is when people start feeling the heat at the polls. Uh, that's going to make the difference. And a lot of the stuff that we can just barely get through, uh, we're going to be getting through with um, votes to spare because of the votes of the uh, that are generated through the Poor People's Campaign. So. Uh, Bishop, thank you so so much. Uh, you called me late at night and, and said you, you wanted 
whatever, uh, and said, and, and I remember he said, look, look, we need we need you to pass. I said, well, it's not going anywhere in, in the Senate. And he said, we'll get it through the House anyway. He said, done. And we got it through. We, took, we talked to uh, Speaker Pelosi and said, we got people who want to fight. Get, let's give them something to fight on. And we got that bill in, in the um, House bill and got it over to, to, to the Senate. And so, and so, Parliamentarian. in West Virginia work on whoever. I know y'all can't talk about that because you're trying to understand the, 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 the decorum around here. But also so that it, it becomes a, an issue yeah. in the election. Well, we, 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 we passed in the House. Uh, I, don't, I, wouldn't mind, like I, wouldn't, I wouldn't mind passing it again. The bill is still, we, we can do it again. But they did take a vote in the Senate. Okay, they did take a vote. So we, 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 know, when, we know where people are. So... I'm, I'm, you know, it, okay. well, wait a minute. It's my bill, so you know I want it. <laughs> it's my bill. I'm, I'm serious about this, y'all, and this is our Congressman Scott could have said anything. He knew it was going to fuck on the point, but literally he responded to what was going to be. So you all, and he knew him, he could have said no to that bill. And a lot of folks said they don't want to pass a bill if they don't think it's going to go all the way. He got to the House. Force that debate and ensure at least now we know who our adversaries are, and we know the ones <laughs> we got to work on. So y'all ought to give us a hand. Yeah. And, and, and let me thank, let me thank Barbara and Camilla and, and Ro for all of their hard work. I mean, we've got some, and, and, and Sheila and Sarah, people who are here today have been fighting this hard, this this fight. Uh, couldn't be in a in a 435 member body, one person. You can't, you can't do it alone. It's it's everybody fighting together, and none of us can do anything without your backing. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Well, first let me just thank uh, Bobby Scott. He's being modest, but that was uh, I remember how that went down. There were people in our caucus who didn't want to have that vote. And uh, Bobby Scott fought, and uh, you don't fight with the speaker, but we persuaded the leadership and the speaker that we needed to have that vote, and we had that vote. And I, let's just give him another round of applause, because that was not easy. I want to thank uh, all of you for your testimony, and of course, uh, Reverend Barber. Here's what I was struck by, by listening to all of you. Uh, what you're asking for is so basic. It's not you're coming here with some new ideas and new fangled theories. I mean, you're just saying, give us a higher wage that we deserve. Give us health care that we deserve. Make sure if we serve the country that we can get mental health treatment like your grandfather. I mean, these are things that people have been fighting for for decades. I was struck, I had the great honor this past Sunday of going to Reverend Barber's church because I wanted to welcome folks to Poor People's Campaign to, to D.C. And the Reverend said something to me at the end. He said, uh, go look at uh, Dr. King's speech in Montgomery in 1965. And I said, I last read that in high school. He said, go reread it. And when the bishop asks you to go read something, you, you decide <laughs> you go do it. You know, so I actually reread the whole speech, and I was struck because yeah, I remembered the phrase. You know, everyone knows the how long, not long, but I was struck by there's this whole middle section in the speech, which is all about economic justice, and 
Dr. King is saying basically that the construct of Jim Crow was constructed to suppress wages for black and white people. And I just want to read this one passage because it was so, I, I reread that speech over and over again, but Dr. King says, then it may be said of reconst the reconstruction era that the Southern aristocracy took the world and gave the poor white man Jim Crow. He gave him Jim Crow, and when his wrinkled stomach cried out for the food that his empty pockets could not provide, he ate Jim Crow, a psychological bird that told him that no matter how bad off he was, at least he was a white man, better than the black man, and he ate Jim Crow. And when his undernourished children cried out for the necessities that his low wages could not provide, he showed them that Jim, the Jim Crow signs on the buses and in the stores, on the streets and in the public buildings. And his children too learned to feed upon Jim Crow. We've got the same thing going on now in our country. Same thing going on now. And so I wanna just say what you are doing in building this multiracial coalition, white, black, Asian, saying we're not going to be fooled by this ugly propaganda in this country to serve elite wealthy interests. We're going to seek justice is extraordinary. And if there's anything that's going to change this country, it's what you're doing. It's the only thing that ever has. So I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time. Know that it matters. And uh, those of us in the Progressive Caucus and who you will certainly do our part to make sure we continue this fight. Thank you very much. Congressman Connor, on behalf of the Poor People's Campaign, our 43 coordinating committees, our 300 partner organizations, uh, dozens of religious bodies and labor unions and, and, and all the people. We know that you have been here with us from the beginning and, and we will continue to fight uh, until we win. And so thank you so yeah. much. Thank you all. You know, everybody at the campaign, if y'all don't mind standing, and we're just gonna end like we're going to the streets on Saturday. Say, we are, we are the 140 million, 140 million. Poor, and poor and low wealth. We are, we are the 87 million, 87 million. Uninsured. uninsured, underinsured. underinsured. We, are we are the 4 million, four million. that get up every morning, up every morning. can buy unleaded gas, can buy unleaded and can't buy unleaded water. We are, we are the 32 million. Who work, hard, who work hard, who made up the essential workers, up the essential work. but we work for less than a living wage. We are, we are the memory the of those that died from COVID, died from COVID. Two, to two to five times more, simply because we were poor. We are, we are the millions of immigrants. Millions of we, are we are the millions of First Nation. Brothers and, Brothers and sisters who continue to fight. Who continue to fight. We, are we are every race, every, race, every, creed, every creed, every color, every, color, every, sexuality, every sexuality, every political party. Every political party. And, we and we won't be silent, be silent unheard, unheard, unseen, unseen anymore. anymore. God bless you all. Recording.